Hey everyone, before we get into tonight's stories, I wanted to remind everyone that for Black History Month, we're raising money for the Equal Justice Initiative. Uh, Straight from their site, they say that they are committed to ending mass incarceration and excessive punishment in the United States, to challenging racial and economic injustice, and to protecting basic human rights for the most vulnerable people in American society. So they fight for marginalized groups, they fight for people who are racially profiled and given unfair treatment simply because of their race. There is no goal in mind, I just want to raise as much as we can, so if you can, the donate button will be to the right of the video if you're on desktop, and below the video if you are on mobile. YouTube covers all the transaction fees, so you don't have to worry about that. Your donation does go directly to the EJI, which will be donated at the end of the month. And I think this is a really awesome, awesome thing to do for Black History Month. So if you want to support, you know where to do it. Thanks again, everyone. I volunteer part-time at a homeless shelter in my city. When I first started 10 years ago, it was part of the community service I had to do for my drug conviction. I remember hating it back then. Part of it was shame, part of it was not wanting to be told what to do. I looked at both the people that worked there and the people who came there for help as obstacles, things keeping me from living my life. Things I had to get past so I could finally start being happy again. But at some point over that year, I started realizing that I was happy again, and that a big part of it was the time that I spent at the shelter. I don't mean to make it sound like it was always fun. There are times when it is really sad or boring, a few times that it's been scary or even dangerous, but generally, it makes me feel better. It helps remind me that we're all in this together, not obstacles to get around, but people all traveling down the same dark and uncertain roads. Thanksgiving and Christmas Day are our two busiest days of the year. The cold weather brings in tons more sleepers, and we're running a meal line all day too. It's usually pretty chaotic, but this year wasn't as bad. It was still busy, but not as much as I'm used to. At first I thought it was my imagination, but by early afternoon, all the volunteers were talking about it. It would normally be going wide open until 7 or 8 at night on Thanksgiving, but this year, we'd still do a trickle by 3. It was a bit weird, especially when we started comparing notes and realized we hadn't seen a lot of our regulars all day long. You have to be careful working at a shelter. The goal is to be friendly and helpful to everyone, but in a detached way. It may sound cold, but you can't become friends with everyone that comes through the door. And getting close to anyone who's come to the shelter for help is generally discouraged. I thought it was a bullshit rule when I started, but over the years, I'd seen a couple of bad situations that developed when people didn't keep their personal boundaries, and so I made sure to treat everyone the same and not get too chatty with anyone in particular. That being said, there are always going to be people you see more often and talk to a bit more. Regulars that are more outgoing or that you get along with. People you miss when they aren't there anymore. Between the ten of us, we were all throwing out multiple people we'd be excited to see this year. Some of which had been staying in the shelter within the last few days. The topic bothered me more than it should have. A slow-turning dread shifting its weight in the peripheral darkness of my mind. I tried to ignore it, but then Phyllis, one of the oldest and most senior of the volunteers, gave it a voice. The ones that were here acted funny, too. I felt my skin prickle at her words as I looked around the old gymnasium that contained both our food line and the bedding area for families. There were a pair of couples, both with two kids, sitting together at one table at the far end of the gym. They'd both been staying with us for a few days, and I'd helped one of them get us signed up for temporary housing just that morning. And they'd seemed perfectly nice and normal since they'd arrived. But then I looked over to the eating area. There were just over a dozen people there, clustered together at two tables and eating silently. That wasn't strange by itself, though we all were used to more noise during holiday meals. It was that it had been the same all day, even when there had been over a hundred people in the room. Rows upon rows of people eating silently, their eyes meeting and then flitting away like dark birds sharing a secret before 
fluttering off in separate directions. I'd noticed it unconsciously earlier, but I'd been busy and preoccupied. And now that I thought about it, I know exactly what Phyllis meant. You mean the way they've been all quiet? Jordan was a newbie. He was pulling community service himself, though he did it with a lot more enthusiasm than I'd shown at his age. Just looking around and staring at stuff? He caught my eye and seemed to be encouraged by my nod. I mean, it's kind of creepy. Richard gave me a short snort. <clears throat> you people. So sorry that the traumatized homeless don't conform to your perfect ideals. Maybe they've got other things on their mind than acting chatty for some weakened warriors who don't have anything better to do. He glanced at Phyllis. Or have to be here. He glanced at Jordan before raking his eyes towards me. Phyllis went to respond, but I beat her to it. Wow, Richard, you're so enlightened. Please tell us how to be better people. But speak up, will you? It echoes a lot when you're that far up your own asshole. Jordan's eyes went wide as Phyllis and some of the others started laughing. Richard's face flashed red, and for a half second, I thought he might actually swing at me. But he just turned on his heel and stalked off toward the storage room. Phyllis reached over and patted my arm. Good one, girly. The brief confrontation had broken the tension, and after another minute or two, people started meandering off to clean up or get ready to go home. I quickly forgot about how spooked I'd felt just a few minutes earlier, and by the time I was carrying out bags of trash to the dumpsters, it had left me completely. And that's when I saw Eddie Camp in the alleyway. He'd been one of the people I'd missed that day. A regular for the last five or six months, had a long salt and pepper Santa beard, and always wore a red baseball cap that said Alabama, though I'd never been sure if it was a reference to the state or the band. And he had a deep, rich voice that he claimed had once belonged to one of the premier radio show hosts in Seattle. I could believe it. He was friendly, funny, and great at telling stories in that jolly but soothing way he had. He would only come into the shelter to stay on especially hot or cold nights, but he rarely missed a meal when it was offered, and despite everything, he always looked remarkably healthy and happy when I saw him, full of energy and never complaining or asking for anything except what was offered. When I saw him last Thursday afternoon, well, I hardly recognized him. He looked like he'd lost 30 pounds in the two weeks I'd last seen him, his eyes small, darting stones sunk deep into the pits of his yellowed skin beneath the brim of his red cap. His lips were dry and cracked, and he licked them nervously as he eyed me from the shadows of the alley. Je Jenna, is that you? I frowned. Was something wrong with him? He talked to me a dozen times, and now he seemed to barely recognize me. Uh, yeah, Eddie. Is everything okay? He stepped forward, and in the better light, I could see how his clothes hung on him now. I went to say more, but he was already nodding and talking. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm just real hungry. Got something in there I could eat. Eddie pointed a trembling finger toward the garbage bags I was carrying. I started shaking my head in confusion. Eddie, what are you talking about? Come in and get something to eat. We've got plenty left. His pebble eyes darted toward the door and then back to me as his lips began trembling. No, I, I can't do that. Just, just if you'll leave this here, I'll, I'll find something good. I'll be okay. I'll put the rest in the dumpster when I'm done, I promise. Eddie, just come inside. No, I can't, I said. They won't let me in there. His eyes widened and he reached out to grab my wrist. Oh, please don't tell him I said anything, please. Looking down, he seemed to suddenly realize he was holding on to me. He let go, trying to smile as he stepped back. I'm sorry, girl, I'm just... I'm just hungry. I was a little freaked out, but I still wasn't afraid of him. Not really. He'd always seemed safe enough, and at the time I was more worried about what had him so clearly terrified. Eddie, talk to me, man. Who won't let you in there? Let me help you. 
He started to shake his head, but then he stopped. He looked at me again, seemed to really see me, finally. And for the first time, he seemed a little like his old self. Jenna, this isn't a good place. Not anymore. People are turning here. Turning mean and strange. I nodded, confused. Yeah, uh, people can be assholes. Is someone messing with you? He shook his head. I'm doing a bad job explaining because I can't really explain, but... Something's taken over here. I see it in the street folk. People I used to be friends with, they've either disappeared or... They belong to that group now. When I frowned at him, he glanced at the rear door and then back to me. It's a, a religion, maybe, or a gang. I don't know. They call it the Crooked Way. They want everyone to join, and if you don't, you get disappeared. I've been panning for days to get a bus fare. I'm going first to next week. I felt myself getting angry. Eddie, that's not right. They shouldn't run you out of town. And they sure as shit are going to keep you from eating at the sh- I stopped as he grabbed my arm harder than before, his voice low and breaking with terror. You aren't listening. You're not right anymore. I've seen things the last few nights. You think I'm just crazy, but look for the signs. They all have a little mark on them somewhere. Their back teeth, they go black, but it's not rot. And they smell like... He looked past me, his face hardened into a mask of fear. Glancing my way one final time, he then turned and ran away, stumbling down the alley and out of sight. When I looked around, I saw two figures standing the opposite end of the alleyway. I couldn't be sure at that distance in the dimming light, but I thought I'd recognize them from the shelter. I raised my hand in a greeting, but then they were gone. I haven't been back to that shelter since Thanksgiving. I was supposed to work on Sunday, but I wound up calling in sick instead. And I haven't felt well lately, that much is true, but a lot of it is a lack of sleep. I keep thinking about Thanksgiving and how strange it all was. And I worry for Eddie, too. I hope he's on a bus headed to somewhere warm and friendly where he won't be hungry or so afraid, but... I don't think so. Because this morning, I went out to get some groceries and found a man sitting on the steps of my apartment building. The guy looked to be in his late 20s, but with the worn down, stretched thin look of someone who's had it hard. He stared up at me as I passed, his face unfamiliar and oddly expressionless. I barely noticed. I was busy staring at his red Alabama hat. Miss, are you familiar with the crooked way? I blinked, half walking, half stumbling down the remainder of the steps backward as I tried to put distance between myself and the man. My heart was thudding in my chest as I turned across the street and get away. No, I'm, I'm not. No, no thank you. I heard the man laugh behind me as I began to run, laugh, and say the thing that still scares me the most hours later as I sit writing this in the public library, unsure of where I'll go when it closes. No worries, miss. You will be. <laughs> you will be. Did you know that you go blind for an average of 40 minutes a day? I'm not talking about when you close your eyes or when you sleep or when you blink. It happens for a millisecond whenever you move your eyeballs. Your brain stops registering visual data to prevent you from seeing the world as a blurry mess. It happens so quickly that it's impossible for you to perceive the lapse just like when you look at a frame by frame animation. Everything seems like one fluid image. But the truth is, you're seeing snapshots. They call it cicadic masking. Your eyes capture data, but your mind discards portions of it for a more stable viewing experience. 
The fact of the matter is that your brain lies to you on a regular basis and only shows you what it wants you to see. If your brain can ignore what your eyes see, then you have to ask yourself what else might it be keeping from you. I found out the horrifying truth when I went in for my laser eye surgery. I've had to wear glasses since I was in grade school, back when calling someone four eyes was the cool thing to do. I got teased a lot, especially after my lenses got so thick that my eyes seemed huge to anyone looking. Now most kids could get away with only wearing their glasses when their parents were around. They'd remove them as soon as the authority figures were out of sight so they wouldn't get teased. I couldn't, because I was so drastically nearsighted and needed my glasses to function. It wasn't until later years in high school that I started wearing contact lenses. I was a little squeamish at first, because shoving one's finger into one's eyes isn't exactly a pleasant experience. That said, it was better than constantly having to adjust and clean my glasses. I used to go through a bottle of spray per week in the winter. It was practically impossible to walk around outside with that fog build up. Contact lenses made everything better. For a while, the lenses were enough, and I enjoyed the freedom they offered me. I can't tell you how depressed I was the day my optometrist told me that I'd undoubtedly need to get glasses within the next two years to keep up with my degenerative myopia. They didn't make contact lenses strong enough for me. This was around the time that laser eye surgery was starting to take off, but it was so expensive that I didn't even consider getting it done. Before long, I was wearing a combination of glasses and contact lenses, just so I could function. Years passed and laser eye surgery became more popular, effective, and less expensive. I graduated college, got a full-time job at the government, and eventually earned insurance coverage. My annual eye exam being weeks away, I decided to take a look at my insurance plan. I knew I was going to need a new pair of glasses since things were getting blurry again, so I wanted to see how much I'd have to spend out of pocket. Lo and behold, I spotted a clause stating 70% off laser eye surgery fees were covered. I was floored and immediately set up an appointment at a local clinic. One thing led to another, and I got booked for surgery. The setup for the procedure itself terrified me beyond words. I was in a dark room, strapped down to a chair while an ominous machine hung over my head, quietly humming as though heralding my doom. My eyelids were forced open using medical tape as though I were in a dystopian sci-fi mind control chamber. Not gonna lie, a big part of me wanted to run away screaming, but then I'd have to pay the $50 cancellation fee and that just wasn't happening. The eye surgeon squeezed a few numbing droplets into my eyes. The prickling sensation made me want to blink away the liquid, but the tape kept my eyelids in place despite my efforts. Whoever decided the procedure needed to be done while conscious must have quite the sadistic streak. I felt my throat tightening as the scalpel approached my right eye. The surgeon's hand had just the slightest tremor, and I could picture him turning my eye into a shish kebab. I wanted to run and scream and crawl back into my mother's womb. No more glasses, no more glasses, no more glasses, I repeated to myself, hoping the mantra would give me enough courage to see things through. My instincts were telling me to close my eyes and look away, yet it was physically impossible to do so. I had to watch the sharp knife carefully touch the surface of my eyeball. The surgeon sliced a flap of my cornea and delicately folded it over, and as he did so, half of my field of vision went dark. The first eye was bad enough, but the procedure was all the more terrifying when the surgeon started on my left eye because I knew it was coming. The pain wasn't nearly as bad as the anxiety building in me as the scalpel neared me once again. Another quick cut, and I was effectively blind. At first, all I could see was darkness and morphing gray shapes like when you close your eyes, but then a small red dot emerged in the distance. The surgeon said it was the laser and told me to focus on it. I locked my warped gaze into the light, but when something appeared in my peripheral vision, I found it hard to keep from straying. I shouldn't be able to see anything but that red light, yet a shape swirled around just out of sight. When I mentioned it to the surgeon, he dismissed it as my brain playing tricks on me. While the laser did its thing, I continued to see an outline in the corner of the room. 
It couldn't have been the surgeon since he was busy operating the laser. Once the procedure was done, I was told to keep my eyes closed for the rest of the day and then they sent me home to recover. The next day, I woke up and saw the world in a completely new light. It was like upgrading from a black and white TV to a high-end HD flat screen. For the first time in my life, I could see clearly with my own two eyes. I could see the tiny rocks on the ceiling, the green on my wooden cabinet, the pores on my skin, the sagging old man hovering in the corner, the flowers in the hall, the holy shit! There was an old man hovering in the corner of my room. He bobbed up and down, looking at me absentmindedly and grinning in a creepy, perverse manner. His flat yellow fork-like teeth protruded from his mouth as his three beady eyes looked me over, sparkling like demonic stars in the sky. I knew that I'd seen him before. Part of me knew that I'd been seeing him my entire life, and my brain pretended he wasn't there. But my eyes saw him nonetheless. As I backed out of the room, the monstrous man clapped his bony hands together in amusement, following me into the hall. The memory of a reoccurring childhood nightmare came flooding into my mind. I was in the woods, running away from the three-eyed man. Whenever he was about to catch me, I'd always make it out of the forest just in time to escape, only to find the ground cave beneath me give, sending me falling down a ravine. I'd wake up screaming for my parents, who comforted me and told me that it was just a bad dream. Yet there I was, face to face with my own personal boogeyman. Though in my memories he was always frowning, the cruel smile plastered on his face made me realize that he knew I could see him now. He knew he could chase me, just like my nightmares. I ran. I ran out of my home, into the street, still in my pajamas. Sunlight stung my sensitive eyes, but the pain was nothing compared to the fear I felt. I didn't even have time to take in the undoubtedly gorgeous view, but something else caught my eye. They were everywhere. Boogeymen, monsters, ghosts, whatever you want to call them, your brain wants to protect you from the truth, but the visual data stored, it's in your mind. And the images come out when you sleep, because that's when your brain loses control and can no longer restrain the memories. Sometimes when the conditions are just right, people can catch passing glimpses of them like a glitch in a video game. In reality... They're always around. You can't run from them. Believe me, I've tried. If you see them, act as though you can't. They enjoy the chase. Don't give them the satisfaction. Your rational brain will lie to you, but your instincts won't. Trust your gut. If you feel like you're being watched, it's because you are. It took the three-eyed man less than two days to catch me. In that time, I saw more nightmarish creatures than you could possibly imagine. I saw headless men, horrid hags, elongated people, and most frightening of all, creatures that looked identical to my loved ones. They stood motionless, a few meters away from me, heads down as they continuously whispered my name. I saw the world for what it was, and it terrified me. In a way, what the three-eyed man did when he caught me it's almost a relief. And I'll never have to look at those horrific creatures again. And hey, I'll never need glasses or contact lenses ever again. Last year, I moved into my dream house with my fiancé. We'd been planning this move for years, and after a lot of saving, in addition to landing our dream jobs in the same city, we were excited to take the next step and put a down payment on a house. When we first toured the place, it was everything we'd ever wanted. It was spacious, had all the modern amenities, had a pool, and it contained a large basement I could convert into an amazing game room on top of being within our price range. The only real concern I had was how many other buyers were looking at the home. We were told that there were a few other couples who were considering purchasing the place in a short conference with my fiancé. I told the real estate agent that she might as well tell them that the home wasn't for auction because we were taking it. As soon as we got some people in there to make sure that everything was up to code, we said that we would gladly buy the house. 
Soon after, we had an inspection done, and I talked to one of the guys about their findings. Just as I had hoped, everything was up to snuff. The only thing of note was that on the first floor, there seemed to be a small door towards the back of the house that appeared to be sealed up and painted over. He theorized that it could have just been an extra guest room that the previous owner thought looked out of place or attracted pests, so they must have decided to seal it away. At first, I was surprised that I hadn't noticed the extra room, and I had a fleeting thought of why the real estate agent hadn't told us about it. I came to the conclusion that maybe she'd simply forgotten about the room, and when I asked if I wanted them to open the room and inspect it, I declined. I figured that it was harmless, and if anything, having an extra room was a good thing. If there were pests inside, I could easily deal with them after the fact, but having to go through another inspection wasn't worth the time or the money if they found something. I was sure that whatever they would have found wasn't something a few bug bombs couldn't fix, if it really did become a problem. Later, we completed all the necessary paperwork, and after a month, we had completely moved in. Things were fantastic for the first few months. Honestly, living here together was everything we'd ever dreamed of. However, not long after we moved in, we started to notice a very distinct smell coming from somewhere in the house. Not being able to pinpoint where it was coming from, we did a complete scrub down of our home and bought air fresheners for every room. This worked for the most part. There were still moments where we would catch whiffs of whatever the hell it was, but mostly covered it up. However, as time grew on, we began to hear soft banging and what sounded like whimpering. I remember more than a few nights where I couldn't sleep, and hearing those sounds prompted me to search my house with my trusty aluminum bat and find nothing. As the weeks passed, these strange occurrences only seemed to intensify to the point where we were losing sleep because of them. Less sleep caused us to get grumpy and agitated more often, spurring on arguments more and more frequently. I'd snap at my fiancé about leaving food out because of the smell, and she'd yell at me about getting security cameras because of the noises. I couldn't take it. I loved my fiancé, and there was no way in hell our dream house was what was going to tear us apart. One weekend, I decided to search every square inch of that house for whatever it was that was responsible for those strange occurrences. Motivated by the return of my peaceful life, I looked at every possible place that something could be out of order, tearing it up and then fixing it again better than I had left it. If I'm being honest, it was probably the most thorough I've been with anything in my life. Unfortunately, after finding nothing, I was at my wit's end. Where the hell could this be coming from? And then it hit me. The sealed up room must be the origin. I stomped outside of the garage to retrieve my tools and then angrily approached the sealed up door, ready to tear it open and expose whatever it was that was causing us so much stress. I easily broke into the sealant, revealing a small door that looked as though it couldn't be hiding anything too conspicuous. Ready to rid this nuisance from my life for good, I flicked the small latch that had taken the place of a doorknob and bursted my way through the room. Immediately, the smell of death hit me. This was definitely the place. I grabbed my flashlight and shined it at the ground. To my horror, I saw what looked to be dozens of dead rodents, many of them with their limbs bitten off. Some didn't even seem to be consumed, so much as their bodies were mangled and eviscerated. I gasped at all the death. My first thought was there had to be some large animal in here that was doing this. I took a step forward into the darkness, plugging my nose as I went. I shined my light to the back of the room, and I immediately jumped back to the safety of the door. Sitting in the fetal position was a meek-looking man. He was completely hairless, save for a few long strands of hair protruding from his head. He had a severe underbite, and his jaw appeared to be broken. His skin was extremely pale, with warts, bumps, and bruises covering his entire body. He looked to be malnourished, with almost no muscle or fat. I wanted to ask what had happened and why he was in our house, but as I began to work up the courage, he began to shriek like no human I've ever heard before. His voice was more akin to a siren than that of a normal man's scream. I wondered how he'd had the energy to do such a thing given his state. 
His mouth appeared to unhinge and it flopped out a ridiculously long tongue as his grayish eyes rolled to the back of his head. Immediately, I rushed out of the room and locked the door behind me. My fiancé came running down the stairs asking me what the hell was going on, but all I could do was to tell her to call the police. They arrived shortly after, and after rushing them into the room, they swiftly made their way in with guns and flashlights at the ready. I could hear the very audible noises of disgust when they saw all the dead rodents, and from what I remember, one of the officers nearly threw up from the stench. But the most concerning aspect of their visit was that they saw no man. All they found were the rodents, feces, and some other unidentifiable stains, but outside of a disgusting guest room, everything seemed to be normal. The officer that had almost lost his lunch suggested that an animal had gotten in and had been living there without our knowledge, and that the shock and fear of me seeing all this carnage must have made me see something that wasn't there. I pleaded my case, saying that this wasn't a figure of my imagination and that they had to do something about the man, but from what they had to go on, there was no arrest to be made. They gave us the number for a local cleaning service before promptly getting into their car and driving away, leaving my fiancé and I to deal with whatever it was by ourselves. She sat me down and asked me if I thought what I'd seen was real. I assured her in that moment in the most serious tone I could muster that what I saw wasn't a figment of my imagination and that it was the thing to make that sound. I also told her that even though it was humanoid in figure, I knew that it was different and that we had to get rid of it as soon as possible. She simply nodded and asked what the plan was. I thought for a second before going up to our room and grabbing the bat. Feeling as though I could scare it away, I decided to give our encounter another try. I went back to the room carrying my bat with a much more fiery attitude, but before I even got the chance to put on my badass act, it screamed again so loud that I dropped the bat and was forced to retreat, ensuring to lock the door behind me. I stumbled out of that room in a daze. My fiancé ran over to me. Her eyes began to water as she saw blood dripping from my ears. She rushed me to the hospital, and it was discovered that I had a burst eardrum. Though I was supposed to be on bed rest for the next eight weeks, I wanted this thing out. I tried various tactics to kill it or get it out. I'd throw in bug bombs, put laced food out for it to eat, tried using a smoker, etc., but nothing worked. For the next month or so, our house became a prison. As I began to heal, we used every opportunity we could get to get out of the house or stay somewhere else. Even though it had never even tried to leave the room, it just didn't feel safe to be in the same general vicinity as it. Hell, even our sex life suffered. Neither of us felt comfortable doing anything in the same house that that thing existed in. For all we knew, it was lurking somewhere in the darkness, watching our every move. Some nights, we'd hear it wailing. There were more than a few occasions where we'd get angry knocks on the door from our neighbors telling us to shut up. All we could do was apologize and make up some fake story of anguish. Eventually, we tried to get other people to see it too. Maybe someone else would know what it was or would have an idea of what to do. We'd call in cleaning services, inspectors, hell, even invited friends over and tried to get them to explore the guest room. Nothing worked. It always seemed to disappear in their presence, no matter how long they stayed. As I made a full recovery physically, my sanity worsened. I was sick of living in fear. I was sick of the smell, sick of the noise. I was sick of feeling like a prisoner in my own home. So I did the only thing that I deemed logical. I bought a gun. 
This was my solution. If I couldn't get it out of my house, and I couldn't make it sick or kill it in any other way, I'd put a fucking bullet in its head. I made a plan with my fiance to kill it the day I received my weapon. I strapped a light to my forehead and held my gun out at the ready as she slowly opened the door for me. I met the creature's eyes. As soon as the light entered its realm, its gaze shifted up at me. I think this was the first time I really got a deep look into its emotion. It's strange. I would have thought that the look it gave me would have been one of fear or confusion, like an animal gives a person right before their car is about to collide with an the street. But no. This look was different. This look was cold. It was almost like it was telling me that this was its territory, and that any intruder would be moved by force. Despite the fact that I had a gun, I was the one who was afraid. I was the confused animal, trying to understand the force coming at me. I remember unloading the entire clip into the thing. To my joy, it didn't even attempt at making that awful scream as I kept firing, letting all my anger from the past months leave my body with the bullets. As soon as it was out, I remember I stood there, taking in the deepest breaths I'd ever taken. It was dead, I thought. A large smile formed on my face, and just as I was about to spin around and give my wife the biggest congratulatory kiss, I heard it start coughing. It heaved, and to my utter horror, I could see the bullets start to leave its body. They started to drop out, almost like sweat, leaving behind a disgusting yellow pus that coalesced against the wound. My eyes grew large, and I immediately spun around, dropping the gun, and closed the door behind me. Realizing my mistake, I told my fiancé to run while I went back to grab my weapon. I quickly opened the door to retrieve my gun, and right in the face was the creature, now standing on long, thin legs. I screamed and grabbed for the gun, ducking out of the way just as it reached out to grab me. I locked the door behind me once more, and fell to the ground once I was safe. I fell to my knees, and I I cried. The emotion came rushing out of me. I sat there for a pretty solid amount of time, bawling my eyes out. In my mind, there was only one thing to do. The next day, my wife and I bought up all the materials we could, and we sealed that room back up. Then we called our real estate agent and told her we'd like to sell the house. I know some of you are going to scream at me for that. Why didn't you burn the place down? Why didn't you fill that room with concrete? Why didn't you tear down the property and build from scratch? Simply put, I don't want that thing to get out. If it's content to hang out in that room for all eternity and bite the heads off rats, that's perfectly fine with me. Honestly, it's a much more comforting thought than it being walking the streets of God knows where, terrorizing God knows how many people. I can't imagine the horrors it could unleash if let loose. Obviously, we can't tell the next buyers about the creature, otherwise we'd never sell the place, but what they don't know won't hurt them. We tried sound and smell-proofing the area as best we could so that it takes longer for someone to notice, but for the time being, I think we're fine. We've already picked out a new place to live in a new city, so we'll be far gone from this place soon. Honestly, there isn't much to say about this. I'm obviously never coming back here. I think my only piece of advice is that if any of you are looking to buy a home, make sure that you check every room thoroughly, even the ones that seem to be hiding something dark. What's lurking in that darkness might make you rethink your purchase entirely. On January 29th, 2020, I murdered Matthew Vincent in the bathroom of Shelley's Diner in Brooklyn, New York. 
While I understand I won't be given much sympathy for my actions, I ask that you all at least give me the time to tell my story leading up to that night and at least try to understand where I'm coming from before casting any judgment. As crazy as it may seem, I'm not a violent person. Despite growing up in a rough area surrounded by violent crime, I've never been someone that felt a dispute should be settled with violence. I've always done my best to be level-headed and living in the city. I've diffused my fair share of fights. I take pride in saying I've rarely raised my voice at someone, let alone taken a swing at them. I don't do drugs. I have no enemies that I know of. I don't do drugs. I have no enemies that I know of. And for the most part, I keep to myself and live a pretty quiet life as head of human relations for a small software company. This is a small part of what made that night odd for me. You can imagine my shock to come out of a dreamlike stupor and find the carved up body of a man underneath me, but let me start at the beginning. I'd recently broken up with my girlfriend of three years, and I was in the process of moving all of her stuff out of the apartment we shared. The details of the breakup were messy, and as a result, I was in a rut emotionally. My work was suffering greatly. There were many nights I simply couldn't sleep because of what I can only imagine was a stress-induced insomnia. The lack of sleep would sometimes inspire me to go on late-night walks around the city just to clear my head. And on one of these nights, I came across a homeless man with a sign that read, Change for Wisdom. I think of myself as a giving person, and I did have a couple of dollars on me. I usually have no problem giving it to those in dire need. Seeing the sign, I reached into my coat pocket, pulled out a $5 bill, and walked over to hand it to the man. I told him to take care of himself, and as I turned around to continue my walk, he told me to wait. Curiously, I turned around and saw that he had a big smile on his face. I examined the gray man and couldn't help but notice that he looked blind in one of his eyes. His yellow smile bore a distinguishingly yellow set of teeth. His overall pale, sickly appearance at first glance seemed to signal that he was in dire straits. Wisdom, he said in a low voice, no doubt ravished by years of smoking. Change for wisdom. I cocked my head to the side, still off-put by the appearance of the man. I thought for a moment and shrugged. I really should be getting going, but I suppose I could use some wisdom. I said, thinking I might humor the guy. His smile grew wider as he motioned for me to come closer. I reluctantly took a few timid steps forward and bent in forward just enough to make it appear as though I was interested in what he had to say. However, as I got closer, I had this deep feeling of darkness for fear of what he might say. His smile grew wider as he motioned for me to come closer. There's a disease. The disease is ever-present. Omniscient. Eternal. It comes for all of us in different ways. It gives a choice. We may not remember our answer, but we suffer the consequences all the same because... He paused for a moment to look away from me for a brief few seconds and looked back at me with watery eyes. Because we always pick wrong. And there is nothing... Nothing but death to watch over us. He turned away from me again... Before continuing, he sprang up and snatched my arm to draw me in closer. When he spoke again, he somehow maintained the same calm yet eerie manner of speech. Permeates all society. Dwells in a plane of existence we can't even comprehend. Its behavior is so destructive to us, but merely a game to it. I say, boy, be afraid. Be afraid of the disease. I quickly twisted my arm out of his hand and launched myself backwards to get some distance. Looking at the man in horror, scrambling to my feet, I tried to find the words to speak to him, but he simply shook his head. You're very sick, he said in a quiet voice. So, so sick. I didn't know what to do, so I just ran home. I locked the door, closed all the blinds, and hid under my covers like a child hiding from the boogeyman. At the time, I didn't know why I was so afraid. He was just some crazy old man. He probably rambled about random bullshit all the time, and yet, 
I was fucking terrified. Something about what he said had struck an emotional chord that I didn't even know existed, but I couldn't place why. The next morning was typical, and I did my best to distract myself from any lingering thoughts about the man I had met. On my way to work, however, I nearly crashed when I thought I saw someone sitting in the passenger seat of my car for the briefest of moments. Once the shock wore off, I realized I wasn't okay, and called into work to tell them I wasn't feeling well and that I'd be working from home that day. I also immediately made a doctor's appointment. By the end of the next week, I had pills prescribed to help me deal with the stress-induced psychosis. But that didn't stop the hallucinations. I went for two weeks on those pills, and they worked for maybe a couple of days. After that, the hallucinations were becoming more frequent, more vivid. I swore I could see a tall, faceless, robbed man who seemed to appear everywhere I went, and no matter what I was doing, I could tell he was watching me. He never interfered with my activities or trying to speak. He would simply observe and then disappear, leaving no trace that he was ever there in the first place. I talked to my parents to ask if we had any history of mental illness in our family, and the answers I got back were that we hadn't. I'd seen professionals about my condition, and the responses were all the same. You're a normal guy dealing with stress. None of this is real. You'll be okay. I talked to a psychiatrist who was convinced I had schizophrenia and prescribed me medication. Still, they didn't do anything to stop me from seeing the man. But even with him, he was still baffled as to how the only symptom I had were the visions. Nothing else outside of normal stress seemed to be out of order. One night, after a particularly stress-filled weekend at work, I figured I'd stop by a local diner to get some food. From what I remember, by the time I made my way inside the store, I almost felt high. I was in a daze as I ordered my food. I only took a few small bites and spaced out for a few minutes before deciding to use the restroom. Almost unconsciously, I grabbed a knife from my plate, found a bathroom stall, and waited inside of it. I heard the bathroom door open. After the person had used the urinal and went to wash their hands, my body rose up to its own accord and exited the stall. Some force was dragging my body towards him as my feet reluctantly shuffled toward the man. He quickly spun around to face me, but before he could get out a word, I plunged the knife into the side of his neck. His head hit the floor with a crack, and I watched from outside my own body as I raised the blade and stabbed him multiple times in the chest before slitting his throat. When I came to full awareness, the man was already dead. I panicked. I dragged him into a stall, washed off the blood, took his ID, and exited the bathroom. I quickly threw down a $20 bill at my table before running from the diner and tossing the knife down a drainage hole, hoping it would never make its way back. As I sped home, a million thoughts ran through my mind. I could see the man from my visions watching me as I killed that man. I could feel my body being controlled by something. I know that I would have never done something like this. Nor would I have wanted to. I felt such guilt for what happened. I was tempted to try and call his family to say I'm sorry, but I could never bring myself to do it. I ended up driving out a long way to burn the ID and clothes from that night and burying the remains. I don't know what's happening to me. I've noticed other small changes, and for the first time yesterday, the man spoke to me in a loud whisper. He told me I wasn't the only one. What the fuck does that mean? Am I not the only one to kill someone like this? Have other people been driven to murder by some unknown force like I was? I don't know. To this point, the police obviously haven't found me. I've been pretty good at keeping my head low, and I have plans to move to an undisclosed location to keep the heat down. But I had to put this up. I had to say that I'm sorry to the family and friends of Matthew Vincent. I'm so fucking sorry for what happened. 
I know this is cowardly. And if I was genuinely sorry, I turned myself in, but I have to find out what's going on with me. After I have my answers, I swear I will come back and let justice take its course, but I can't figure this out from inside a prison cell. To all the others I may have heard along the way, I also apologize. The other night I had to stop myself from beating another man to death. Wherever I go, I can't promise that my mind will always be my own, but I will do everything in my power to make sure that no one else gets hurt. If this is the disease that the homeless man warned me about, I can only hope that I can bring us closer to the cure. I just hope to God that one exists. My wife and I had recently purchased a new home, a beautiful Victorian house on 30 acres out in the country. We'd worked so hard to build our credits, save the money, and get through the god-awful process that is buying a house. The place was stunning, and it couldn't have been more perfect. It had five bedrooms, a detached garage, and a basement that I'd planned to turn into a man cave, a place perfect for raising a family in one day. It was a rather warm spring day when we were finally able to move. Bryce, come here and look at this, Rachel said as I was bringing in boxes from the truck. She motioned me over with a swift wave of her hand. She had the door open to the basement and was moving her neck back and forth, squinting in the dark. What is it, hon? I asked, setting down the boxes and walking over to where she stood. Do you see that? She asked, arm outstretched into the abyss. At first, all I could see was black, but the longer I looked, the more my eyes adjusted and I could just barely make out two glowing yellow dots at the foot of the stairs. Boo, I yelled, nudging my arm into her back, causing her to jump. What the hell, Bryce? A half-smile, half-scowl crossed her face. Oh, come on, that was funny and you know it, I chuckled, leaning in to kiss her. No, I don't think so, mister. She said, pushing a finger to my lips. You don't get a kiss after that. What is that? Her scrutiny being drawn back to the yellow dots. If you were smart, you'd turn the light on, I grinned, rolling my eyes at how ridiculous she was being. She stared at me, her eyebrow arched. Now don't you think I would have tried that already? She replied. I plodded around her, extended my arm to flip the light switch. Nothing happened. That's odd, I muttered. I'd replaced the bulb before we moved in, as I knew I would be using the basement for storage and the light had worked the day before. Turning around, I grabbed the flashlight that was laying on the stack of boxes I'd brought into the house previously. The glow of the flashlight lit up the stairwell, revealing an empty light socket. Oh, who's playing the joke now? I asked, shooting Rachel a smirk. Her face was puzzled as she had no clue what I was talking about. Put a bulb in there so we can see what's down there. She nodded toward the empty socket. I dismissed her cluelessness, deciding that I wouldn't give her the satisfaction of pulling one over on me and just replace the bulb. The bulb roared to life, lighting the stairway, but there was nothing at the foot of the stairs. Where did they go? Rachel chimed. They were just there. Tell me you saw them. I had seen the dots, all right, but they hadn't concerned me since I was the reason they were there. Rachel had a severe pet dander allergy, but absolutely loved cats, so I buy her stuffed animals, usually little kittens, for special occasions. They typically make her smile, and she'll add them to her growing collection. I was at a flea market the other day, and had found this life-size stuffed calico with bright yellow eyes, and immediately thought of Rachel. This thing looked almost real, and I knew she had to have it. So I bought it, and left it at the foot of the basement stairs for her to find when we moved into the new house. But now that the light was on, the cat was gone. That's strange, I said as I clambered down the stairs. Be careful, Rachel joked. There might be a monster down there. Where had this stuffed cat gone? It was literally just there at the bottom of the stairs. I searched the rest of the basement but could not find it. Confused but not 
Overly worried, I climbed back to where Rachel stood. What was it? She asked. Oh, probably just an odd reflection. I replied, not wanting to spoil the surprise. I'd have to search under the stairs later. It probably just fell over and was wedged under the bottom step. I'd move it to a new location for her to find when she wasn't paying attention. The rest of the day was spent unpacking and cleaning. It was rather uneventful. Bryce, what do you want for dinner? Rachel asked. Dinner time already? I've been working so hard to make the house homier that time had slipped by unnoticed. Yeah, I'm going to run into town and pick up something. Uh, I'm thinking pizza. This was perfect. With her out of the house, I could find the stuffed cat and put it somewhere for her to find. Sounds good, babe, I replied, hiding my eagerness for her to leave. I'll get supreme and cheese, she called as she walked out the door. The moment I heard her car pull out of the drive, I rushed down the stairs to the basement. I lay down at the base of the steps, the cold cement pressed hard against my chest. Shining the flashlight under the step, cobwebs loomed in the open space, but there was no stuffed cat to be found. Where the hell are you? I whispered under my breath. This was the moment that I should have turned the house upside down, found that stuffed cat, and burned it in the fireplace. However, at the time, my mind immediately rationalized its disappearance. I left the basement and resumed unpacking until Rachel arrived with our dinner of pizza and salad served on paper plates and consumed from the couch that was still sitting outside on the porch. The night was tranquil. A light breeze wafted around us as little moths and other night bugs danced around the ambient glow of the porch light. Uh, I'm so tired, Rachel exhaled as she pushed herself off the couch. I'm going to bed. You coming? She asked, opening the front door. No, I think I'll do some more unpacking, I replied, then followed her inside. Rachel climbed the stairs to the master bedroom as I opened the trash bag to throw our remains from dinner in. I started to walk toward the basement, then I heard an excited scream from upstairs. I love it! Rachel exclaimed, bounding down the stairs two at a time. In her hands, she was clutching that stuffed cat. Where'd you find that? I blurted out, completely dumbfounded on how the thing was upstairs. It was on the bed, silly, she cooed, stroking the calico's dark fur, its yellow plastic eyes gleaming in the light. I, uh, I stuttered. I'm, uh, I'm glad you like it. We kissed, and Rachel climbed back up the stairs, crooning over the stuffed cat. How did that thing get up there? I know I never put it upstairs, and nobody had helped us move, so someone else putting it there was out of the question. After another hour of unpacking and racking my brain about the stupid cat, I gave up and went upstairs to get some much-needed sleep. I woke the next morning to Rachel sneezing. Uh, she said, tissue pressed to her nose. I can hardly breathe. We probably shouldn't have stayed out on the porch last night. My allergies are kicking my ass. She groaned through her sneezing. Her eyes were glossy and red. I've never seen you have allergies like this from being outside, I replied, concerned. Well, we've never lived in the country before either. She plopped back on the bed with a whoosh. She stretched her arms out across the bed and sat up and craned her neck over the side of the bed. If you see my kitty, I want to cuddle it and sleep this off, she asked, continuing to search the floor for the stuffed cat. No, did you put it down somewhere? I asked Rachel, and Rachel groaned and snapped her head toward me. Don't you think I'd remember taking it somewhere? Her voice growing agitated. Okay, jeez, babe. I'm sorry, this allergy attack has made me miserable. She reached out and squeezed my hand. I know it'll make you feel better. A Zyrtec and a fresh cup of coffee, I said, crawling out of the toasty covers and making my way downstairs. Still rubbing the sleep out of my eyes when I reached the kitchen, my bare foot contacted something oozy and wet. Looking down, I saw a small pool of white liquid. Is that... ranch dressing? I wondered. As I looked closer, I noticed that there were pizza crusts, croutons, and a few pieces of lettuce along with the ranch strewn across the kitchen floor. What the... I trailed off as my eyes caught sight of that damn black stuffed feline sitting on the floor next to the trash bag that I'd put our scraps in last night. 
The bag was in ribbons, and the leftovers were strewn about. Rachel. She'd been playing a joke on me this entire time. She had to be. I picked up the cat and raced upstairs. Haha, <laughs> very funny, babe. You get to go clean that mess up. I snarled as I burst through our door. Oh, don't try to pretend like you're asleep, I smirked, pouncing on the bed, sending her petite frame flying up in the air a few inches. She didn't move. Rachel? I whispered, using my fingers to crawl her back slowly. She still wasn't moving. Placing the cat on the bed, I grabbed Rachel and rolled her toward me. Her face was blue and her eyes were darting back and forth. She clutched her throat with one hand while the other hand moved frantically up and down my arm. Rachel, what's happening? I screamed, panicking, not knowing what to do for a split second. Hastily, I scooped her up in my arms, the weight of her body pressing down hard on them. With her in my embrace, I rushed down the stairs as fast as my legs would carry us. I didn't even stop to put on my shoes as I exploded through the front door. I placed Rachel in the passenger seat of my pickup, her eyes almost bulging out of their sockets, still clutching at her throat. I sped around to the driver's side, wrenched open the door, and cranked up the truck. I flew out of the driveway, gravel spewing out behind us. Rachel, stay with me, I shouted as I frantically drove toward the hospital. The hospital was 15 minutes away from our house, or at least it was as fast as I was driving. By the time we made it to the emergency room entrance, Rachel was unresponsive. Her body had slumped over in the seat. Doctors and nurses performed CPR on her as they wheeled her down the hallway. Sir, you'll have to wait here, I remember a nurse saying. Or was it a doctor? I don't know. Everything about that day is a blur. I sat in that waiting room rubbing my hands together for what seemed like an eternity before this slim, white-haired physician tapped me on my shoulder. Excuse me, are you Mr. Bryce Howard? He asked me, a solemn look on his face. I nodded. I'm sorry, sir, but it seems your wife had an allergic reaction, and even though we tried, we were unable to revive her, he stated. After that, he simply walked away. A while later, a nurse approached me, asking if Rachel had any known allergies and where she had been at the time of the reaction. I explained that the only known allergy she had was to pet dander, but we didn't have any pets. The nurse wrote down my response and walked away. After filling out paperwork and answering question after question, I was finally able to leave. I arrived home to my front door standing wide open. I guess in my rush I'd forgotten to close it. The second I crossed the threshold, I melted to the floor. The pain that I was too numb to feel at the hospital, flooded my mind and I wailed, tears rolling from my eyes like a faucet. I can't describe what I felt at that moment. All I can say is that there is no comparison. The loss of a loving, wholehearted wife, especially like that, is something indescribable. After hours of sitting on that hard floor, I was able to push myself up. The sun was already sinking low behind the trees, and as I made my way up the stairs to our bedroom, the bed sheets were pulled down to the floor, and that goddamn stuffed cat was rolled up inside them. I don't know why I did what I did next, but I charged over to that thing, grabbing it up with a quick snap of my arms, and ran back downstairs. You son of a bitch, I yelled through my gritted teeth as I threw open the fireplace door and slammed the thing down inside. I fumbled around through the box next to the brick ledge of the fireplace until I found lighter fluid and matches. I don't know why I was yelling at the stuffed animal as I doused it in propellant. After all, it was just a toy, right? Meant to bring children and joy and something to cuddle with, right? But I continued to pour out the flammable liquid until the bottle was gone. I fumbled through the box of matches until I pulled one out. I even hurled the entire box into the fireplace for good measure. Striking the match on the brick, the match roared to life in the colors of blue and amber as I flicked it into the fireplace, the contents igniting with a whoosh. I stood there and watched that adorable little gift that I'd given my wife as a housewarming present was lapped in flames and turned to ash.
The little plastic yellow eyes didn't melt, so after the fire went out and things had cooled off, I reached in and pulled them out. They shone brightly in the incandescent light of the ceiling fan, almost as if they had been untouched by the smoke and flames. I rushed outside and hurled them into the trees behind the house. Two days later, the hospital released Rachel's body for the burial. The blood work results confirmed that it was a massive allergic reaction to pet dander. I couldn't wrap my head around how that would even be possible. We didn't have a pet, only her stuffed animals. I still don't know why it took me so long to understand what had really happened. Why did my brain try so hard to rationalize everything and hide the truth from itself? It's only been two days since I buried Rachel, my stunning young wife to whom I would have given the world as I sit here writing this. I know what happened. I see it now. Those yellow eyes are staring back at me through the back door and whispering the truth. My eyes are starting to water. And the air is growing thin. <laughs>